Welcome back after break. Uh, just before we went for a break, which chapter were we looking at? Chapter two and talking about family. Okay. Uh, an important thing we need to remember as ministers of God is don't think that your family members are to be preached at at all times. You know, we're so used to preaching sermons that we can start preaching sermon to our wife, to our children, anytime they do anything wrong and we give them scripture and quote scripture and uh, Bible verse and, you know, chapter and verse. Okay. We shouldn't be doing that. Okay. So when you have issues at home, problems at home, you're discussing some things, you know, you need to listen to them, you need to reason, share, discuss, talk things more practically, you know. Uh, also, when you come home uh, from ministry, what happens? We are constantly talking about who did what, who came and met you, what problem they're going through, what happened, so sad, this person is hospital, that person happened like this, this person is going to go to a divorce, this, you know, um, this child ran away, all of those issues you're talking at home. And so the, the spouse and the children are, uh, you know, get, uh, they get upset because when you come back home, you're not willing to listen to their problems, their issues. So important to, you know, leave aside ministry where it is when you come back home you're a father you're a husband talk things related to your spouse and to their children your children what happened in their day uh, during their day what is their problems what are the issues they're facing how you can help them out okay also um talk personal and family issues before ministry same thing you know avoid taking back all of your who you met, what happened, who did what, you know, who said what, and all of those things, leave it behind at church, at your church office. When you go back home, you know, uh, spend time, talk with what concerns your spouse and your children, what is uh, their interest, what did they go through, and, um, uh, you know, realize that when you go back home, you are not a pastor to them. You are a husband. To your wife or you are a uh, wife to your husband and you are a father to your children or you are a mother to your children so don't talk about ministry okay and it's good not to discuss about other people's life at home just concentrate on what is happening at home and how you can best uh, relate and uh, help them at home okay uh, spend time with your children we've already spoken about this you know as ministry goes sometimes you know we kind of compromise on spending time with our children but it's important that we spend time with them uh, do what they like to do you know and also important to do what is important for them don't say okay let's go out here they might not be interested maybe they want to be at home you know and just color and paint or you know they want to, you to sit with them and watch cartoon network or you know they're drawing they're painting they wanted to play with them uh, I, you know i know my uncle was a pastor but uh, he was you know when he was with his children he would just be with them you know he would play hide and seek with them running and catching he would um, you know discuss things with them have quiz from the newspaper tell them to read the newspaper have quiz and do various fun activities with them and it was always a big joy to go and be with my uncle because you know he would do such fun related things even though he was a pastor you know he would not bring his pastoral responsibilities home and son he would be a different person at home and he would not even look at him as a pastor he would just joke and you know do funny things we just had such a good time uh, with him and his children really enjoyed their father even though he was a, a pastor okay so important to do what they like what uh, is important to them and when we do that basically you know you are um, uh, you're showing that you're interested in what interests them and then you gain uh, the right to speak into their lives and write upon their hearts so when you speak to them you know uh, about their behavioral issues or things that they're going wrong things they're doing wrong they will listen to you they will talk back to you because they will talk back in the sense they will tell you what they are thinking what they're feeling because they know that you are genuinely interested in their uh, 
um, lives. Um, you know, um, something to keep in mind is when when you go through life, when you look at things, whether it's, it's a news on the TV or you read something in the newspaper or your children come back home and tell you this is what happened in school, this is what they, they heard, this is what is happening around the world. Is it true? It's good at those times to, you know, kind of slowly uh, teach them from God's word. Rather than saying, don't do that because God's word says that it will just totally you know, irritate them, but it's good to use situations in life. So if your uh, child comes back home and says, you know, the teacher was very angry and they pun she punished the whole class, but it was not my mistake. It was just one girl's mistake in the class and all of us got punished. So you can say that's sad to hear, but as a parent, you can also talk about something from God's word. So the same way, you know, Adam and Eve sinned, but all of us are facing the consequences of that sin. So you see, you know, with just a small note that we're bringing in and trying to teach children from God's word, and it it they relate better. You know, when I go to school and teach children, they say that they learn better not through the concepts that you teach them, but when I give them real life examples or I give them examples from my own life, they say that is what registers in their mind, that is what they learn more fun. So even situation, things that happens in people's life are good times to teach godly values, inculcate godly values in the lives of our um, children. Okay. Um, look at what uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 verses 6 and 7 says. Can somebody read that please? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 6 and 7 verse 6. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. And verse 7. You shall teach them uh, diligently to your children and shall talk of them uh, when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. So here God is saying teach children what? When should you teach children? Every time, at all moments, at all situations, in all times. So just use situations to teach them, uh, you know, truths from God's word there are also times when we can just speak prophetically over your children's life you know god is leading you sometimes to speak prophetically into their lives to make declarations decrees to speak that over uh, their lives don't say you know like a prophet thus says the lord and you know just just tell them to speak over their um, lives uh, pastors also mentioned that he loves to put his two children to bed you know um, just pray for them when they are just before they go to bed give them a hug and a kiss and say good good night to them uh, also at those times he says those are real good times when he can connect heart to heart with them you know when they're sharing some things on their mind and uh, he can just speak to them he can help Help, help them even as they just go or fall off to um, sleep. Okay. Another important thing as ministers of God is not, it's not a sin. It's important that we schedule family vacations, have family time with your uh, uh, family, take them out for an outing. You know, all of these little things that you do, you know, family outing, vacations, celebrating their birthdays, your children's birthdays. Children will remember it for the rest of their lives. It will be lasting memories okay so it's good to take uh, time off even from your ministry just spend time with your family and uh, just like jesus did you know uh, we read in mark chapter 6 verse 30 and 32 jesus told his disciples come let's go away to a deserted place to a lonely place and rest a while um, because many were coming and going and they did not even have time to eat so they took a they took the boat and they went off to a very quiet place to spend time. So even Jesus needed that quiet time. So it's good to take quiet time. Okay. Maintain your family altar. What is family altar? Family prayer time, basically. Okay. So it's good to come together as a family to uh, don't do it as a routine. Uh, it's for the sake of doing it. But you know, let it be more exciting, creative. Um, sometimes, you know, just worship God as a family. Sometimes just pray. Sometimes pray in tongues. Uh, you know, um, Pastor also says that uh, during his um, 
family time with uh, prayer time with his children he has taken them through the book fulfilling god's purpose for your life and also who we are in christ just talking about who their identity is so it's not like giving them a lecture and teaching them but actually discussing with them and it's a good time to teach and inculcate these godly values okay the next one is put family time before ministry time we've already spoken about it uh, guard your family while ministering to people now sometimes when we are ministers of god and we are ministering you know uh, people expect that you know we as ministers should be superly anointed people uh, holier than thou attitude and also our spouse and our children should be the same and uh, sometimes you know there's so much of demands uh, laid on pastors family their wife their spouse and children that uh, many times they get so uh, they don't have the freedom to be who god wants them to be they have to come into a mold or wear a mask just because people want them to be a certain type and that really frustrates them and they come to a place where they get very frustrated and rebellious and they can rebel so you know um, let your spouse and your children be who they want to be not that that does, that does not mean that they should be wild and just do what they want to do but they live according to godly standards but not like you know oh you're a pastor's child so you should not wear this you're a pastor's child or you're a uh, uh, you're in full time your 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 parents are in full time ministry you should not be doing this you should not be going there you should not be playing you should not be saying this okay so don't get them to conform to a certain pattern and a mold okay also it's important that you know we don't open up our homes to people to come you know uh, like a ministry office and i've seen that in many um, ministers of god who've opened their homes up to um, you know people that they're ministering to you know whether they're ministering to youth or drug addicts alcoholics they've opened up their homes to people to come in and out and be there and the children go are led astray and it's very sad i've seen uh, two families uh, do this so it's important that keep church separate and home separate okay if people have to come and meet you they come and meet you in your church office and not your home home is a place for you your spouse and your children it does not become your church office it becomes does not become a home where you know it's like not an office where people are open to come 24 7 and just be there and live there and do things that is going to cause a lot of chaos so you need to protect uh, your home um, and your family okay the next thing we need to remember is uh, don't step out and don't step in okay don't step out means marriage is between it's a covenant between god and husband and wife okay don't let any other person enter your marriage okay so don't uh, allow any other man or woman enter into your marriage just saying that hey they're my good friend i'm just counseling them i'm helping them you know sometimes it happens like that you know a man of god is counseling a young woman and she keeps coming home you know and uh, we've seen um, very sadly that uh, you know the minister of, or the man of god goes away this with this woman that he's counseling and leaves his wife and his children okay so don't allow anyone to step in it's best that as men we counsel you counsel men as women we counsel women we don't step out of our boundaries there as well just one initial meeting is okay but if they need other follow-up meetings always put them over to somebody else okay very important to do that also don't step into somebody else's marriage you know when you as a pastor you want to your people come to you with marital problems you are trying to help them finally what happens when you are counseling as a man you fall in love with the woman who's already married who comes to you with a marital problem or if you're a you're a female counseling you're counseling the man who's come to you with a marital problem you know you tend to have a relationship with them so very dangerous you know uh, you know need to keep your boundaries when to step in when to um you know not when to step in and step out don't step in and don't step out don't step out of your own marriage don't step into somebody else's 
um, marriage. Okay, and if you need help, you need to get help soon. Sometimes we think that we are in ministry. You know, it does not mean that we don't need help. We need help because we are human beings. We are frail. We are weak. We go through challenges. We go through problems and difficulties. So it's important for us to get help. And also it's important for us to know that as ministers of God, we are not anointed and gifted in all areas. So we need people with different anointings to help us, whether it's people who strengthen marriages, people who are gifted and anointed in marriages, homes, families, uh, handling finances, administration, organization, you know, or addictive behaviors. We need their help and support. So it's good to you know, learn to receive from other people. And also when you go through problems and difficulties, don't say, you know, don't put the blame on Satan. Don't say the devil is doing it. The devil is trying to destroy my home. I'm under spiritual attack. No, we know from the word of God, when are we led away into temptation? How are we tempted away? When are we tempted? By our own evil desires. It's our own desires that lead us away. It's not just Satan. It's our own desires that lead us away. And when we are led away, you know, and given to our our own uh, sinful or uh, carnal desires, it leads into uh, sin and to temptation. Okay. So it's important that, um, you know, even though we are called and anointed by God, we have our own weaknesses, limitations, uh, problems that we go to. So it's important that we take help. Don't think, okay, if I go and take help, you know, everyone will come to know, everyone will laugh at me. You know, don't let pride stop you as a minister of God. How can I take help? Don't let fear stop you. But if you are stopped by your pride and your fear, then the problem is going to escalate. It's going to become bigger and bigger and it's going to blow out. And you know what happens when there's a bomb explosion, right? You know what happens when there's a volcano? Volcano, it's slowly, you know, burning on the inside. And one day when the pressure is so high, intense, it bursts open and it causes such a lot of devastation and such a lot of problems. So don't wait till the problem occurs. Get help. You know, go to people who are prayerful, who can handle your problems with confidence and who can help you. And so your life, your family, your ministry, is all well protected the sooner you get help the better okay and the last thing is your ministry is not a family business okay now um, it's god's plan and purpose that you know his faith and revelation move on from one generation to another generation for god it's important that one generation passes on their faith and revelation to the next generation and the next generation builds on that as the foundation okay if it's not passed on then they will go back to many generations past so you keep passing it on they build on the you know where you have built on and they continue building on from um, there so it's always wonderful to see you know entire families and generations of people in a specific family, just doing the work of God over many generations. So some of you say, you know, my father is a pastor, my grandfather was a pastor, my great grandfather was a pastor, and I'm also called into pastoral ministry. That's a great thing because God has called you. Okay. So, you know, and um, many of you in your families are gifted and anointed in various ways. You're looking and you're using your gifting and anointing to build up the body of Christ. However, there can be a wrong side to this, you know. Now, suppose your father is the uh, pastor of a church and he started the son. All your, your, your mother, your siblings, your father's brothers, your cousins, everyone are part of the church. And all of them are handling different church uh, aspects of the church or areas of the church, even though they are not gifted in that specific area. So it becomes like a family business. The church becomes like a family business where everybody is running it and they're not gifted in that specific area. And that is not a right thing to do. It can also be disastrous. And we see this in the life of the Old Testament. Whose lives do we see? 
Eli the priest, you know, his two sons, you know, what a mess they made and finally they died. And also the sons of Samuel, right? They were not called to priesthood. But they had made such a uh, you know mess of the the priestly duties, the sacrifices they were making. Everything was so detestable and unholy in God's sight. So it's important that if people have a gifting and calling in that specific area, it's good to use them. It does not mean that your ministry becomes a family business. Okay. So these are some things that we can keep in mind even as uh, as ministers of god as people who are in ministry you know how we can conduct our family life or how we can engage in our family lives to honor god okay any questions ma'am uh, should we always use bible verse to our family member when they do mistakes okay do we always um, should we always use um, bible references to our family members when they make mistakes what do you what do the others think oh, come on give me your suggestions a simple practical thing suppose your father's a pastor anytime you do a mistake he gives you a chapter and a verse how would you feel take the mic and speak please if uh, i am doing mistake on something like situation is something else and on that time if somebody is counseling me and uh, is uh, putting bible verses again and again i got irritated i don't want it i need a solution of my problem and you are putting bible references again and again what is that <laughs> like this situation will come so it is like uh, according to situation we have to do things yes according to situation you need to discern and tell them maybe sometimes people mostly look for practical things if you give them chapter and verse they get irritated and sometimes they won't even want to do anything with the bible okay so good to be practical but when they are maybe they know that they, you're getting irritated with them giving bible verses when they come back and tell you hey it worked you can tell them you know where i got the solution from they say where did you get the solution from then you can say you know you can give them chapter and verse and then you can tell them hey you know something any and every problem the solution is in the bible you're just telling them that so next time they go looking for solutions in the bible so a, you you need to do it in a very creative way yes yeah anyone else any questions Online students, any questions? Very quiet, all of you are. Ma'am, suppose a pastor is gone for his preaching, means he has called for in preaching in some meeting. And during the meeting, his preaching, he got uh, a news that his son is serious. So at that time, what will be his response regarding? Okay, um, a man of God is preaching. The son is very serious. What would you do, Nelson? Son is very serious. What would you do? Come on, what would you do? Continue the preaching, okay? Can you please take the mic? I heard one time with the testimony that there was one pastor in the morning he got her, uh, his son was died and that day was Sunday and he has to go that taking care of church and he has to go preach, preach them people. Then after this, he said to her wife, that because they were, I mean, sad, it's naturally they were sad, but he said to her wife, we will go for preaching and after this, after ending of church, he said to all people's church, then, I mean, my son is died. And after they prayed. And after then, he came back home. And their son was alive. alive. Oh, the son became alive. Yeah. Okay, that's a wonderful uh, testimony. 
What would you all do? You preach. What is the priority? God first, family second, ministry. Right? So in your context, Nelson, I would what would what would the online students do? Online students, you're preaching somewhere, your son is very, very serious. What would you do? You continue preaching. I think I will just ask somebody else to share whatever or just, you know, one sermon is not going to do anything. Yeah? One sermon is not going to do anything, but me being with my son or my daughter uh, is important for the family. Otherwise, they are going to think, you know, it was not there when my son was, wife will get upset. It, it, it's something that they carry lifelong. You know, the children will carry it lifelong. So I think it's important to be there with your family. One sermon is not going to change the entire world and is not going to bring salvation to the entire world. God can even work. You can ask somebody to preach and help and uh, minister. Attend your family responsibility. Yes. Daniel says, um, Lucy says, attend family. I will reduce the sermon and complete it as soon as possible to be with my son. I think I will just leave immediately. But in your context, I had a pro issue like this one Sunday, I was supposed to go and preach at APC South. And early in the morning, at around four or five, my, my father and my sister were uh, to catch the Shatabdi to Chennai. They had an accident. Then um, I got a call and um, I, they were badly bru hurt. So, you know, I had to rush. I went, they were in the hospital. So I went and then I had to take care of my dad. He had some stitches and all of that. My sister had to catch the train. So I had to go to the uh, station. I had to drop her, I had to come back and bring dad home. And I immediately messaged pastor and, um, you know, uh, some elders at APC South. And they said they had somebody who can back me up. I said, I'll try coming because the service starts at eight o'clock. And it was, so I just, you know, I, I could do everything. I dropped my father home. He had the stitches. My sister was off to Chennai, even though she had the bruises, she had gone. I put her on the train, I sent her and I came, I brought dad home and uh, he was fine. So his, all his every vitals, everything was normal, BP, everything was normal. So then I just left and I went um, and I preached and came back. So that is okay. But then if you preach, you have to preach and then as an emergency, you get a call and as an emergency in the family, I would just rush. Because family is more important and there will be somebody who can always fill in for you. Sanjay says only a surgeon soldier is required to complete his or task before taking on another task. Priority is important. Okay. Only surgeon and soldier, not a minister of God. Okay. Any other questions? Good question. Life and death situation. Okay. Yeah, this was a life and death situation. So Nelson was saying, your son is very serious. So would you preach or you would go to take care of your son, to, to do what it requires? See, it's a life and death situation. You said it's very serious, right? So, yeah. Okay. Any questions? No online students, you have any questions? Okay. Yeah, I think in situations it varies, right? Uh, situations you need to discern and see, and what God is leading you and take. Uh, God has given us a mind to think and to guide us and lead us. Okay, we'll move on to the third chapter, people. Okay. Now, Christian ministry is all about ministering to people, touching lives. Okay, touching lives with God's power, his love. Okay, rescuing them from Satan, bringing them out of darkness into his marvelous light, uh, training them up in 
righteousness, holiness, in Christ likeness, and helping them to identify, know what is their calling, their plan, and their purpose, and to fulfill their God given destiny uh, that God has for them. It's also ministering to people so that they encounter Jesus Christ and they are transformed into his image. But the biggest challenge in Christian ministry is who? Or what is the biggest challenge in Christian ministry? Who or what is the biggest challenge in Christian ministry? It's, yes, it's being with people and working with people. And that's why Paul rightly says, our fight is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers, you know, forces in the uh, heavy realm. So it is actually Satan working through people, but sometimes or most of the time we are fighting people. Okay, so biggest challenge in Christian ministry is dealing and working with people, understanding people, how to treat them well, how to lead them, manage them, guide them, correct them, equip them, empower them, and release them to their destiny or their calling that God has for them. Okay, so uh, we can learn various life ex experiences even as we relate with people and sometimes we made such uh, mistakes that you know it gives us such a punch on our face or such a uh, hard time that you know it uh, it keeps a lasting memory for the rest of our lives and we learn precious and valuable lessons but we need to learn that ministry is all about building people look at what paul says in first corinthians chapter 3 verse 9 and 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2, and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. So can somebody read those three uh, scripture passages, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9. You are God's field. You are God's building. 2 Corinthians 3, 2. You are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and 20. For what is our hope, or joy, or crown of rejoicing? Is it not even you in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? For you are our glory and joy. Amen. So here, what is uh, Paul saying? He's saying that people are God's field and God's building. And so he's saying, he's telling the church at Corinth that, you know, um, uh, both Apollos and Paul, even as they are ministering, they're basically building God's building, which is people, and they're ministering in God's field, which is also uh, people. So Christian ministry is basically serving and building people. Okay, it's Christian ministry is not about building our own empires, our name, our fame, um, you know, uh, building a huge church, but it's basically building people okay so here we are here to serve people we are here to help people and we're here to help um, them you know lift them up uh, help them to grow into more christ likeness and christian maturity and paul says in second uh, corinthians chapter 3 verse 2 that people must be written on our hearts that means what what does he mean by saying that people should be written on our hearts Who do you have in your heart? God. <laughs> Who do you have in your heart? Huh? People you love very much, right? People who are very close to you, are very close to your heart. You hold them dear to your heart. So when you write people on their hearts, you know, um, it means that you are there to serve them and not use them. Okay? You're there to build them up mold them up in the ways of the uh, Lord. They're there to lift them up. And then he says in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 19 and 20, that, you know, uh, uh, what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? So he says that when we meet God, uh, it will not be how much messages we have preached, how many churches we built, how many places we've gone and preached, how many sermons we preached, how many books we've written. No, it is what is our joy and rejoicing 
It is how many people we have served and we have led and brought them into the saving image and the glory of God. How many people we have led to the Lord. That is what is going to give us our joy and our rejoicing and our crown when we stand before God. Okay. Um, John Blessy has a question. According to Luke 14, 26, why did Jesus say that to hate father and mother and children? And he says that those who do, does not hate, he cannot be my disciple. What does it mean? It basically means that when um, our love for God or our calling uh, for God or our um, uh, what God has called us and purposed us for us to do, if it if it um, uh, our family supersedes that. Our love for our family supersedes that. And we're not fulfilling our call and purpose for our life. You know, it means that. So that means it says when God calls us, when he calls us to do a specific uh, assignment, uh, fulfill a specific call in our life, even our family should not, you know, kind of stop us from fulfilling that call and that purpose. And it does not mean that when we are fulfilling God's call and purpose, we neglect our family. So that is not the posture. So we maintain all three postures, right? Our calling supersedes our love for our family. But at the same time, we need to take care and love our family. And we need to nurture them and provide for them. OK, does that help, John Pressy? Okay. OK. So when we're ministering to people, we need to understand that growth happens in different stages. And we need to be very, very patient. OK, so when we're ministering to people, we need to realize that, you know, the level of maturity they are in. Now, suppose you finish one year of Bible college or you finish three years of Bible college and you go back to your church. You have a church, you're ministering somewhere and you just teach them about the Holy Spirit. You teach them about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, they're not they're not in a mental state to come or maturity to come to that level where they can receive it. So what do you do? You start off in a, you know, from the basics. Maybe you can start off with the foundations or you can start off with fulfilling God's for your life or you can start off with who they are in Christ. So build them up knowing where they are. So all of our sermons that we preach, even as we are ministering or in, this is in the context of a pastoral context, you know, we don't just preach sermons just to fill up the time, but rather we preach, and also we don't preach sermons what people like. Some people say, Pastor, please preach about prosperity. Preach how we can be blessed. Preach how we can handle our family, children. A whole year we can't keep preaching the same sermons. So if you look at APC, you know, throughout the year, Pastor has, you know, has different um, um, sermon topics missions, evangelism, family, marriage, you know, who we are in Christ, uh, books from the Bible that we study. So it's different, different, in different um, areas of our spiritual growth, are uh, different topics that are taken. And he chooses according to where we are as a church. Okay. So sermons that we preach should not be just to fill up time. Um, each sermon that we preach should be, you know, uh, moving, helping people move towards spiritual maturity, towards higher level, and to move them towards their destiny, towards God. Okay. And also, we need to be clear where our congregation is spiritually and uh, what God wants us to preach and teach them. So, even if you're called somewhere to preach and teach, don't say, okay, I'm going to preach this because. You know, I think this is a good sermon. But you need to ask God, God, where is this people I'm going, this uh, youth or these children or this um, people I'm going to preach, where are they spiritually? What do you want me to preach or share with them? Not what you feel like and think, but what, you know, God wants you or is leading you or the Holy Spirit is guiding you to uh, preach and to uh, teach them. Okay. The next one uh, with regard to people is that we need to honor everyone. Okay. Look at what Romans chapter 12, verse 10 says. Uh, can somebody read that, please? Romans 12, okay. Be kindly affectionate to one 
another with broadly love in honor due preference to another one another yes so it says you know be kind affectionate honor giving preference to one and other okay so we need to honor people and not discriminate based on social status economic status you know or uh, you know the different uh, denominations that they come from we need to uh, treat people everyone whether they are rich poor everyone we treat them the same and we serve them the same because each one of them are precious in god's sight and each one of them are purchased with the blood of jesus christ what that's what we read in the beginning right we are purchased by the blood of jesus christ so we need to honor each one and we need to treat them everyone same because all of us are part of the family of god okay uh, does god show partiality does god show partiality no are you sure some of you are doubting okay his god is not partial i think it's romans chapter 1 verse um, uh, 16 that says or i think it's romans chapter 1 verse 11 or says in romans sorry romans chapter 2 verse 11 says for there is no partiality with god okay romans 2 11 okay, god is not partial okay so we shouldn't also show partiality but we need to honor everyone and gen genuinely care for people not just show people that we care for them so that they will come to our church and they will give us you know some good gifts and bless us with some good things but genuinely care for people Okay, how do we honor elders, leaders, and fathers? Look at what First Timothy chapter five verse seven says. Can somebody read that, please? First Timothy chapter five verse seven. First Timothy five verse seventeen. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of doubt honor, especially those who labor in the wall on. and doctrine so those who are elders or leaders or fathers in the house we need to give them what just honor double honor especially those who are teaching the word and doctrine okay so we need to give them double honor okay that means we need to give them great respect sometimes as younger people you know we are more tech savvy uh, we know a lot about technology and we can look down and we are more quick and efficient and we can look down on older ministers um, because they don't know many of the things that we know okay but it says here we need to irrespective of whether they know or not we need to respect them and give them honor uh, respect and honor why because for the things that they have already accomplished in the kingdom of god okay they have built on something we are building on that okay the next generation comes have to show you greater honor and respect because they you have built and they are going to continue from there okay also we read um, uh, uh, we shouldn't show partiality we've already talked about it okay uh, paul is writing to young timothy in first timothy chapter 5 was 21 very important let's read that can somebody read it for, please first timothy 5 21 first timothy chapter 5 verse 21 i charge i charge you before god and the lord jesus christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without project project uh, prejudice prejudice without prejudice without prejudice doing nothing with uh, partiality. partiality yes So here is Paul is telling uh, Timothy to lead how to lead and serve God's people okay and it's very interesting when he's telling Timothy he's giving him this charge he's telling him that you know the Lord Jesus Christ himself and the elect angels are witnesses to how we relate to 
people. So how we treat people, okay, in other words, you know, how we um, uh, relate to them, uh, who is watching us, who is our witness, Jesus himself and the elect angels, okay? So this is um, an important instruction which we must not avoid and we cannot violate how we relate to people. Sometimes how we talk to people, you know, whether it's people working under us or the you know, maids who come to our house, you know, or the 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 person over the counter in the shop or the salesman the saleswoman or the auto rickshaw person the cab driver how we talk to them sometimes in a very demeaning way but when we do that or how we speak to our spouse or how we speak to our family people you know our children sometimes you know is saying that god is actually uh, watching over us he's listening to jesus christ and the elect angels are actually are witnesses for how we treat people okay so um, um also when we are you know treating people we need to be mindful that we don't treat you know uh, based on their social and economic status also when we correct and discipline people it we also do the same thing whether they are very influential whether they're very rich you know, we don't treat them in a or discipline them in a, in a nice way. And those who are poor, we're not rude and in a harsh way. But when even when we're disciplining people, we discipline everyone the same way. We treat everyone on the same way because when we stand before God, all of us, whether we are maids, whether we are uh, uh, you know drivers, auto rickshaw drivers, or whether we are cleaning the drains, or whether we are you know, managers, CEOs, doctors, engineers, ministers of God, we are all standing on the same level, you know, and God sees us, everyone, the same. So we are no one to, um, you know, differentiate with people. Last thing we will look at before we close today is say thank you, which is very difficult for many of us. You know, we need to be people who are thankful, thank God himself, um, thank God for the people that he's placed in our lives. When we thank people who God has sent in our lives, we're actually realizing who we are and what we are. We're trying to say, hey, we, we cannot do everything on our own, uh, with our own uh, strength. It's because of, the God, of God's grace and your assistance and those working alongside us that we can do what we are able to do as ministers of God. Sometimes as ministers of God, we take people for granted, right? We say, hey, they're coming to our church. I'm feeding them spiritual food and it's their right to do this for me or do that for me or help in there in the church. So we feel almost as, as if it's a right for people to help, support and encourage us. But it's not our right. Our right is God who sent them for us to build them up, to be shepherds over the sheep and not lord over them and not exercise our right. And it's not their right that they have to treat us well and support and help us. But we need to care for them. And when they do something, it's okay as ministers of God, as people in higher levels of position to say, thank you, right? Uh, I, I always, uh, you know, learned this from my mother. When the maid, you know, when she does the housework and she leaves, my mother will always tell her, thank you. My mother is much older to her. My mother is paying her. She doesn't have to say thank you, but she always tells every day, says thank you. See, and I just learned it from her. So even when the maids, when my mom's not there, maid tells me I'm going, I say thank you. So we learn, you know, and it's important to thank them. It's important to thank people who bring your food or, you know, the auto driver who, uh, you know, brings you in the auto rickshaw, the cab or the, the driver, you have a driver at home or the gatekeeper who opens the gate for you or, you know, that's small things. The shopkeeper who gives you something when you ask, say thank you. The waiter who takes your plates, you know, after you eat, say thank you. Okay. Uh, it just, just shows how grateful you are to God for little things that God has blessed you with. Okay. We'll stop here. Any questions anyone else, anyone has? Any questions? We'll continue this in the next class. When will we have the discussion about the assignment too, please? What discussion do you want, uh, Nisha?
the discussion is um, the, the questions are going to be um, uh, the same way like we had for the first assessment, but it's all based on the book uh, Receiving God's Guidance. Yeah, I'm going to release the assessment uh, today, uh, say around by 6.30 or 7, and you can submit it on uh, Sunday um, by, you know, just before uh, midnight. You can submit it by 11.59, okay? Um, if you have any emergencies, anything, you can let me know. Uh, but just remember, checkbox questions are all more than one answers. And multiple choice is just one answer, and there can be some true and false. But everything is from the book, Receiving God's Guidance for Your Life. Yeah, So you can read that, and you can just, uh, so, yes. You have a question? OK, uh, we'll, we'll end class here. Thank you all for uh, joining class. Um, have a blessed weekend, and I'll see you next Friday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.